Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Thank you for joining me again this evening. I am happy to be happy to be with you again. Had some good meetings in the United States in Phoenix, Houston, and Orlando, and um, I, I, I'll be putting up the videos very shortly. I, the, the the ones from Phoenix are already there, and I'll be putting up the others as soon as possible. But I'm glad to be with you again this evening, and. Um, this afternoon, I'm, I'm going to be doing things a little bit different because I'm just going to be um, focusing on a topic instead of instead of continuing with the, sub, the study on Romans. I'm going to pick up on Romans next week, but this evening I just feel like focusing on something relating to the law. And in fact, as you 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 can see, the the subject this evening is. <clears throat> Does the law lead to bondage or does the law produce bondage? I have been have been motivated to speak on this this evening, to discuss this, to study on this this afternoon because <clears throat> over the past couple of weeks and even since I came back I've encountered so many misunderstandings, misrepresentations and outright false accusations where the, the law is concerned. And I suppose for the umpteenth time, I would like to try again to explain the biblical understanding on this subject. I mean, I know that no matter what I do, some people won't listen, some people won't hear. Uh, maybe it's a waste of time to go over things again, but at the same time, it's on my heart, so I might as well do it. So, hopefully, you know, some of those people who are accusing us of abolishing the law, of, of saying that the law is not a good thing, of breaking the law. You know, the accusations are many, f fast and furious and, and, and foolish. <laughs> but... Real accusations, and I, I want to be able to try to clear up some of the misconceptions this afternoon. I just want to say hello to my brothers who are here, brothers and sisters, Florian, Ralph, Chris, Diane, Carlos, Manos, Robin, Jen. Greetings. Uh, I'm glad to see all of you and look forward to us having a good time this evening. Um, so I'm going to um, pray ask you to bow your heads where you are and we're going to um, ask the Lord's blessing on our study this afternoon. Father, we thank you that we can be here together studying your word. It is my prayer that you will bless us with insight and understanding and clear minds as we study together this evening. In Jesus' name, Amen. All right, um, Sister Sharon, greetings, greetings, uh, Sister Ruth, Ruth and Anne from Norway. God bless you. So, um, let me kind of, kind of set the stage and give the background for this, for what we're going to study this evening. And I'm, I'm going to be very free, and um, I'm just going to go as the spirit spirit leads because I'm not um I don't have a set outline before me this afternoon people have been making the accusation against me and against those of us who hold to the to, to a similar belief they have been making the accusation that we have been teaching that the law is something bad that the law has been abolished, that we're, we're free, that we're, set, we're letting people know, we're letting people think that they are free to sin and to live any kind of way that they please. I know all of us are aware of the foolishness of this accusation. All right, I know we are. Those of you who joined me on this, on this webinar, you fully understand these issues. But 
I don't know if it, as I said, I don't know if it makes sense to continually try to bend over backwards to explain to some of these folks because part of the time, half of the time, or maybe more than half of the time, the problem is not that they can't understand, but that they don't want to understand. I believe that biblical teaching on this is so clear that it it mystifies me, truly mystifies me, and it saddens me to see people who, you know, I have considered to be friends, people who should know better, carrying on this kind of way and making these false accusations and, I mean, outrightly spreading lies. So, does the law lead to bondage? What does the Bible say about this? Thank you, Sister Jackie. God bless you. Nice to have you all with me. I'll, I'll, I'll greet you all at the end of the, the, the study. Um, I'm going to go to the Bible. All right? And um, what, what people don't understand is the is, is how can it be that something that is good, as the law is good, and I should start there, I should start there. Let me say right at the beginning, again, that I agree with the Bible. The law is holy. Romans 7 and verse 12, I know where it's found. The law is holy. The commandment is holy and just and good. And in fact, I should go to the verses because, let me just make sure that we read them through together. Romans 7 and verse 12 is what I said. It says, Paul, Paul speaking, wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. There's no question that it is, it is something good. It is holy and just and good. There's no question. So let that be said right at the beginning. Nothing that I have ever said or or will say, is to be construed to mean that the law is not a good thing. Um, in Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, down near the end here, it says in verse 31, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Now, I believe this. So, Whatever you believe, whatever anybody believes about what we believe and teach, let this be foremost in your mind. I believe that the law is holy and just and good. I believe that we do not make the law void through faith, but we establish the law. All right? So, that being said, if we can get that out of the way, we can get down to the question of what then is the problem that, that I have with the law? This is a question that I... It came to my mind in, 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 in my recent visit to the United States. When does something that is good become something that is bad? When does something that is good become bad? Or I could say, when does something that is good serve a bad purpose? And the answer is, there are, there are tiers of good, right? There are tiers of good, there are levels of goodness, there are degrees of goodness. That's why we use the, 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 the different comparisons. We, we say good and we say better than there is best. So, when, when something that is good keeps you from what is best, at this point the good thing is not serving a good purpose. It has become an obstruction to something better. And therefore at this point it is serving a bad purpose. Now the thing that is good does not become bad because it is used for a bad purpose. But it becomes bad in the effect it is having. And in this case, it needs to be taken out of the way that you can have access to what is better. This is, this is an argument that some people find very difficult to understand. And I don't understand why, because it's very, it's very, very simple and very, very clear. All right? When a child is, when, when, you're, when you're a small child, you drink milk. Okay, you, you drink with a, 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 a baby bottle, a feeding bottle. The feeding bottle is good. And the milk that you drink is good. When you are 10 years old, if, this, if, if you continue this process and it prevents you from eating solid food, 
You continue to drink milk when, when you are 10 years old from a feeding bottle. Then the feeding bottle, which is good in its proper place and right, has become something harmful. It has become, it, it serves a bad purpose. It is being misused. And in this case, it needs to be taken out of the way. Somebody needs to take it away from you and teach you, teach you how to eat solid food. That illustration should help us to understand what I'm talking about. And, and if, if you are one of those persons who just can't get it, then the, think about the illustration because it's not just true about babies and feeding bottles. It's true in many other areas. It's true in how we relate to the law. So, this is, this is the issue. This is the problem that people keep on, keep on thinking that because the law is good, then it is good for every purpose. But this is not what the Bible teaches. And I want to go to the Bible here now to really point out that, the, that what I am saying is very clearly taught in the Bible. I'm going to look for a word here in the book of Galatians. All right? And the word I'm going to look for is the word bondage. In fact, let me look in the book of Galatians. Just in the book of Galatians because in this book, Paul makes it very clear that the law actually brings people into bondage. Now, let me start with, I'm going to start with Galatians chapter 4 and verse 3. Let me start with Galatians 2 and verse 4, all right? Now, Paul is talking in this chapter, he's speaking in this place about the Jews who followed him around trying to persuade his converts that they should be they needed to be circumcised and to keep the the rituals to observe the ceremonies and rituals of the law and he talks about himself and Titus going up to Jerusalem in Galatians chapter 2 and he says here in verse 3 when he went up to Jer Jerusalem he says let me start from verse 1 then fourteen years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and I took Titus with me also. And I went up to Jerusalem by revelation, and I communicated unto them the go that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. But privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. What Paul is, Paul is saying is that I went up to Jerusalem, and I spoke to the other disciples, the other, the other apostles, I'm sorry. And I spoke to them privately, those who seemed to be leaders among the apostles. Notice he says, to them which were of reputation. He means he spoke to those who had a name for being leaders among the apostles. He went into them privately. And he says, lest that by any means I should run or had run in vain. What he's saying, I wanted to corroborate or to make certain by talking to these people that what I was saying, they also agreed with. We were, not at, we, were, we were not in conflict with each other. And he goes on to say, in that context, he says in verse 3, But neither Titus who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So, he's saying that these elders, these leaders, these, these, these prominent apostles, they did not require Titus to be circumcised even though Titus was a Greek or what would be referred to as a Gentile. And the point Paul is making is that the, the gospel does not, does not require Gentiles to be under the dominion of the law as the Jews were under the law. Titus was not compelled to be circumcised. But see what he says. I'm, I'm looking at the word bondage here, right? I'm focusing on that for the moment. He says, and that because of false brethren. This, th when he says that, he's talking about that idea. That idea that Titus should have been circumcised. That idea came about because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage. All right, so the reason I, I, I went to this verse or this passage is because I want to make it clear 
that the Apostle Paul in this book is referring to bondage as meaning to be subject to the law, to, this, to be subject to the requirements of the law. This is how Paul is using the word bondage in this, in this verse. And we will see that he's using it the same way right throughout the book of Galatians. Now, I'm asking all those of you who will watch this video, especially those of us who have objection to what we have been trying to share, I'm going to appeal to you to be honest, to be honest and to think about what I'm saying with an open mind and honest heart. This is the word of God. It's not, it's not a joke. It's not something to, to, for, for ridicule. It's something that God has given us to help us to be better people. And so that we can be in harmony with his, his mind and his plans. So, so let us consider this seriously and honestly. I know that for many of us the problem is that we can't get away from our past teaching and the traditions that we have been bred, bred with, brought up with. But we have to try to be open-minded and to be sensitive to what the Word of God is saying to us. So, so Paul uses the word bondage to refer, to refer to a state in which one is under obligation to observe what the law says. False brethren brought in wanted to spy out the liberty of the Christians and to bring them into bondage. Now, I'd just like to step back for a little bit up to Acts chapter... 15 because I want us to see what exactly these false brethren were, were were demanding now first of all it says in Acts 15 verse 1 and certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses you cannot be saved alright so here is the key point they want the Gentiles to be circumcised in the way that Moses prescribed. And they were, they were trying to link this work of the law to salvation. They were saying that in order to be saved, you, uh, Christ is not enough. You must also include the works of the law. So, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dis dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Now it goes on to say, in verse 4, And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were, were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. I'd like to pause at this time and just make another point. Alright? The law of Moses. What does he mean by this? I've seen... I've seen some of, some of our brethren... Moving heaven and earth. Bending over backwards. To try to, to, to prove that the law of Moses... Was simply... The ceremonial laws and that the Ten Commandments were not considered to be a part of the law of Moses but I as you, we don't have the time to look at it this evening but I'm going to tell you that as you look at the New Testament concept of the law this is a this is a completely false idea as far as the Jews were concerned the law of Moses is the same thing that was sometimes referred to as the law and the prophets, which is sometimes referred to as simply the law. It referred to what God gave through Moses to govern Israel. It says, it says in, in John 1 and verse 17 that the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Was any of the law given by Moses? I mean, what part of the law did Moses give? If, if, if any of the part of the law was given by Moses, Moses was an imposter. 
The law was not given by Moses, it was given by God. Every part of it, including the, the requirements to slaughter animals and to and to washing of dishes and, and to changing bread on the table and to burn incense, everything was given by God. It was not Moses' invention. But the Bible calls it the law of Moses because God used Moses to give this law to his people, to his professed people, to his designated people. So, it was not the law of Moses, but it is, it is designated as the law of Moses because in John 1 and verse 17, John wants to show us that Jesus Christ brought something greater. So he says, the law was given by Moses, or through Moses, but grace and truth came by means of Jesus Christ. Something greater, something better, something superior. But this law of Moses has to do with everything that God gave through Moses. And this includes not just the ceremonial laws or the health laws or the judicial laws, but also the, what is called the moral law or the Ten Commandments. So this whole system of the law, it was given as a package. And we're going to see this more clearly when we go to the book of Galatians. All right. The obligation to observe the law was, 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 was re referred to as Paul, as bondage. Now anyway, let's go back to the verse and see and continue. It says, th this group of Pharisees rose up saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses, everything that was commanded by Moses. Now, as I'm saying, this included the entire package of the law, including the Ten Commandments. So Paul says, going back to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 4, that these false brethren, he's referring to these Pharisees, these supposedly converted Pharisees, he calls them false brethren, and he says, they, they came in to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage. Sometimes I feel like we're going through the same exact scenario today. Same scenario. Now I believe that Paul was a, I believe that Paul was a person who walked in harmony with the, with the law. Paul was not a libertine. He was not a rowdy person. And neither am I by God's grace. Paul was not a person who, who disregarded the Sabbath or, or killed his enemies. After he found Christ, he did not do this. He, he did not hate his enemies. He did not steal. He did not break the commandments. And yet he was teaching that we are not under the law. We are not subject to the law. The law brings us into bondage. So, what I understand from this is that it is not necessary to be under the law or to be subject to the law or to be bound by the law in order to live a righteous life. This is a fallacy. This is the what I call foolish. I mean, it's a stupid idea, honestly. This is a stupid idea that some people are promoting that if, if, if we need ten commandments in order to know what is right and wrong. This is so unreasonably foolish that it appalls me that adult people, seemingly intelligent people, could continue to propagate such, a, such nonsense. People who are not Christians, okay? You can go any place in the world and go to the worst kinds of people and ask them, is it right to commit adultery? Is it right to steal? Is it right to kill? And unless the person is mentally unbalanced or being deliberately objectionable, they will tell you clearly they believe it is, it is wrong to steal. They might do it, but they know it is wrong. They might steal, but they know it is wrong. In other words, even the, even the ungodly and the heathen know the basics of the Ten Commandments. If, 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 if you are a Christian and you need ten statements to help you to understand what is right and wrong, how do you claim to be a Christian? How are you a Christian? How do you even... Even, even suggest that the Spirit of God is in you and you don't understand basic right and wrong? This is so absolutely stupid. It's stupid. But, but, but it, 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 is, it is embedded in the minds of people because it's what they have been taught from, from, from infancy or, or, or from association with denominationalism. 
Of course, many will say, well, what about the Sabbath? A lot of people don't know that the Sabbath is something that God wants us to keep. And I agree that where the Sabbath is concerned, you do need information. Because there is no, there does not seem to be any natural, natural law, any natural law that we can sense or feel or discern that makes us know that we should set aside the seventh day as a holy day. This is a privilege that we need to be instructed about. We need to be taught. But you see, the point is, do we need to be taught through the commandments or by some other means? When you go to the Bible and you go to the very second chapter in the Bible, there you find the Sabbath. And the Bible says that God blessed the Sabbath. He gave it some special benefit. And he set it apart for a holy purpose. He, he sanctified it. So he, there was some special benefit placed on the seventh day and it was set apart for a holy purpose. There you see the reason for Sabbath observance. There, there is nowhere in this, in this chapter where it says that where, where there's a command to keep the Sabbath holy. Okay, I agree. And um, this is why I don't believe that Christians live by being commanded to do things. Those of you who know the Lord and love the Lord, I believe you can testify with me that you don't, you don't, you're, you're, you don't serve the Lord because He demands it of you. I mean, that is, that is so obvious. But people, people don't think about what, what, what they believe and, 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 and about their worship. You don't, you don't, your wife or your husband does not appreciate you because you demand and you keep demanding. I know that uh, 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 when somebody is in a relationship with another, another person and it's a demanding relationship, you know, you, you might identify that person as a gold digger. That's the kind of person you want to get out of that relationship. You want to run away from them because they make your life stressful. And after a while you get the impression that this person does not care for me, for myself, but is after what I have to offer. God does not demand. When God put people under the law, yes, certain demands were made. They were commanded to do certain things. And, and what we also need to remember is that every command under the law was backed up by a penalty. You can't give the law without giving the penalty. And this is why you find that people who are law-oriented are also penalty-oriented. They, like they like to give veiled threats. Judgment is coming and you are going to get it, alright? <laughs> I've experienced a little bit of it even, even over this past week, alright? It's amusing. I mean, sometimes you just have to, have to laugh and you have to... You're tempted to mock. You're tempted to mock these people because what they, what they do, they try to threaten you. They, like to, they try to threaten you with God. All right, they try to use God as a weapon and say, because you don't agree with me, because your doctrine is so heretical, God is going to get you. And I, I want to laugh because it, it is so amusing to me that these people who don't have a clue of the kind of person God is want to use my father to threaten me. It's pitiful, but it's amusing. You know, anyway, when, 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 they, when they present an argument to you and they find that the argument you have no use for the argument and you can overthrow the argument easily, then they, they resort to other means to threaten you. You know, they, they start to try to threaten you. And um, anyway, that's a little bit by the way. But this is, this is what happens when people are law-oriented. They, they need a rule before they can perform. And I tell you, if you claim to be a child of God and this is your condition, you need to Go back and find out what Christianity really is. Christians do not serve God because of fear. They do not serve God because they are threatened. They do not do the will of the Father because they, it is demanded of them. Yes, God does command in the sense that He's our Father and He has some things for us to do and He says, do this and do this. Okay? So if you want to define that as command, fine. Okay? However, when people talk about keeping the commandments, most of the people who emphasize this, they mean 
You are commanded to do this or else. That's what they mean. That's what, they, that's what is implied in the word command. My own perspective has been that God informs us of what he wants. He informs us. Like I may say to my wife, sweetheart, I'm so hungry. I don't need to say anything more. All right? You, I, I, I can guarantee that if I say this in a little while, I'm going to get something to eat. I don't need to, to demand and say, why, 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 why haven't you prepared some food for me? You prepare some food or else it's going to be trouble. I mean, goodness gracious me. That is how some people think that God operates. And I, I am agreeing that there was a time when God did function in this way. More and more, I'm, I'm finding out why he did it. I'm finding out that there was a good reason. But at the same time, people believe that this, this is his permanent attitude. They believe this is a true way that God operates. They are scared of this God who makes such demands on them and threatens them if they fail. Because they don't know God. What I'm re realizing is that the greatest tragedy in all of this, brothers and sisters, is the terrible misunderstanding about God that this kind of false, false teaching and false thinking promotes. So, you know, I, 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 may, I just may not get to my point. I might get a little bit confused and drawn off track. So what I'm really saying, and what I really want to say is that, here's, here's what I'm saying in a nutshell, all right? The, the law, the commandment is holy. It's just and it is good. But it is being misused because people don't understand why God gave it. People believe that we Christians function, we perform because of these demands that the law makes on us. We have a relationship with the law instead of the law giver. And we think that if I relate to the law and I do what the law says, the law giver may favor me. I don't know him. He's far, he's far away and he's distant. So let me deal with, 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 the, with the commandments. Their logic is that you can't have, we say we are Christians, but our relationship with God is not perfect, so we need the law. We need the law to, to substitute, as it were, for that perfect relationship. I want to encourage you about something, all right? I want to encourage you about something. There are people, you, I'm talking to you, my brothers and sisters, all right? There are people out there who deny the gospel. They deny our message. They say that we are, we are teaching people cheap grace. They say we are, we are teaching people that it is okay to sin and be accepted of God. Well, I know that even in the days of the apostles and even in the days of Jesus, there was a Judas among the, the twelve disciples. I know that even in the days of the, the, the apostolic church, in the height of that divine glory, there was a man in Corinth who took his father's wife. My goodness, you couldn't, you was Ananias and Sapphira. There was Simon Magus who wanted to pay Peter for the gift of, of the Holy Spirit. There, there, there have always been people who misuse freedom when they are given freedom. It will always happen. But this does not mean that we take back the freedom that God has given to people. It does not mean this. God sets us free because he believes in the gospel. God gives the gospel and he knows the power that is in the gospel. Therefore, he sets us free. My, my plea to you, my brothers and sisters, and, and it's my plea to myself too, is that we live and operate in such a way that these detractors, these naysayers, these, these, these critics may be compelled to say that the, the, the gospel is producing great fruit in our lives. I understand we can't live to please people. I'm not for that. Okay, I understand this. All right. I know there will be people who walk around and they look in your plate to see whether, <laughs> to see what you're eating. All right. I know there are people who will walk around with a ruler to measure your, your dress, how long it is. I know there are people who will cast their eyes on your hair, your hairstyle and, 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 and every little thing. All right. I, I put up a post on uh, somebody was 
you know, somebody was saying critical things, and and I I I posted, ye fools, and um. Anyway. I posted the statement that Jesus Jesus made. You fools. Well, first of all, he said to his own disciples, you fools and slow of heart. And there's another one where he spoke to the Pharisees and he called them fools. And you know, people people came in with their remarks about me, my, my, ungod, my godless attitude and um, how Jesus says, don't call any man fool. And I'm thinking... This is the problem with legalism. You read words and you don't understand. The same Jesus who says, "Don't call any man, don't call your brother fool." If you say you're fool, you fool to your brother, is in danger of hellfire. The same Jesus referred to the scribes and Pharisees as fools, and he called his own disciples fools. So, so you condemn me for emulating Christ. You condemn me for being like Christ. And this is the, the mindlessness that comes when you, you, under, you, 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 you read words, but you do not understand principles. You don't understand the ideas behind those words. But what I'm saying is, I want to encourage all of you to live, it, live in such a way that people know that your bodies are the temples of the living God. You, you will never please these folks you will never please everybody i i used to ask myself the question are you really a true christian and the reason why i asked the question was because everybody was my friend all right i, I read where 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 jesus says beware when all men shall speak well of you for so they speak of the false prophets goodness me I had friends everywhere until I began to teach righteousness by faith until I came to understand the righteousness of Jesus Christ then I understood that Jesus is a stumbling block I understand that God has put in Zion a rock of offense and a stone of stumbling and people keep stumbling over that stumbling block because when I began to lift up Jesus Christ it seems like astonishingly I made enemies everywhere and as much as it hurts, it, it, it has a twofold effect. There's a feeling of exhilaration, and yet there's a feeling of disappointment. But there's exhilaration because I feel like, okay, so now, not all men are speaking well of me. So maybe, maybe, I'm being qualified to be not a false prophet. Maybe, maybe finally I'm in the right place. But at the same time, it is... It's a cause of real distress to see how people misrepresent and mis misapply and abuse the word and uh, in trying to overthrow the Bible truths that we are sharing. So I'm saying, anyway, I want to encourage you brothers and sisters to live in such a way that whatever accusations people make against you, it may be either false or silly all right somebody might look in your plate and say oh look at this person this person is eating fish or look at this person that dress is just below the knee people are stupid this kind of way all right so you can't pay attention to that kind of foolishness I for myself I try to dress modestly I try to eat carefully I also try to exercise I try to get enough sleep. I try to live a healthful life. I try to avoid behavior that will be an offense to the weaker brethren. And besides, I want to live a healthful life for the Lord's sake. So I, I, I avoid certain things. But I know that I am free to do these things. But as Paul says, do not let your liberty become a cause of offense to other people. All right? You have to live for the sake of the weaker person. But what I'm saying is, when they look for reason to condemn us because of our, our gospel, let them continue to be telling lies. Okay? They say, they say we have a harsh spirit. They say we speak evil things. I have not seen it. Okay? But I've heard the accusations. 
let it be that these accusations continue to be nothing but lies because our, our behavior is behavior that will exalt and glorify our King and make people know that the gospel, the true gospel of salvation is righteousness without the law, is holiness without commandments, is conformity to the will of God by the indwelling Spirit of Christ. Let them know that the gospel works. So, anyway, back to the Bible and, and let's see if we can finish up this thought about bondage. Does the law really bring bondage? We go to Galatians, we continue with Galatians and I want to go to chapter 4. And this is where, above, above all other places, this idea is brought out more clearly. Paul says, speaking of the people of God. In fact, I'm going to go back to chapter 3, Galatians 3. All right, I'm going to go down to the bottom of this chapter. And Paul says, let me read a few things here. Paul says, let's start from verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. Notice the phrase, under the law. Shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. So we were kept under the law or we were kept under the schoolmaster. And this schoolmaster was to govern and control us because we did not understand nor discern this faith which should afterwards be revealed. So when was this faith afterwards re be revealed? It was when Christ came. It was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It was when Christ came that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now, when it says to bring us unto Christ, does it mean to bring us unto Christ in our own personal experience, like me? I was not a Christian until I was 22. Was the law my schoolmaster to bring me to Christ and then at 22 I was justified by faith and then I'm no longer under the schoolmaster? Is this referring to something in my personal experience or is this something in the history of God's people? Let me go back up to verse 19 of this chapter. Look at verse 19. Paul says, Wherefore then serve at the law? What's the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. It says the law was added till, until the seed should come. The law had an expiry date and that expiry date was the coming of the seed. This does not mean the coming of the seed to me or to you. It means the coming of Jesus to the earth. Until he came, the law was given, it was added. And so when he says down here, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. He's talking about until the seed comes. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. And then he says, there's neither, verse 28, for there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and ears according to the promise. So he says that if you belong to Christ, then you become the children of Abraham and you become, you are inheritors of the promise that was given to Abraham. Now with this background, let's go over to, to chapter, to the next chapter, which is chapter 4. Now Paul says, now I say that the heir... Paul says that the, the, the heir, as long as he's a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. Now when he talks about the heir, he's talking about the same person that he mentioned in the, in the previous chapter. You go back to the last verse of chapter 3 and it says, 
If you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and you are heirs according to the promise. He's talking about you. You, the people of God, you are the heirs of God according to the promise made to Abraham. All right? Then he says, now I say, but I'm going to tell you something, that the heir, the same heir that is you, as long as he's a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. Now when he says, you, as long as you are a child, is he speaking about you as an individual? Or is he speaking about the, the people of God as a group? What we can see is that the coming of the seed affected all of God's people, not just you as an individual. He's talking about a certain point in time, not a certain point in your experience, but a certain point in the history of the Christian church. He's talking about the time when, the, when Jesus came. But he said, let me tell you something about the heir. Somebody who inherits. As long as he's a child, he's no different from a servant, even though one day he will, he will be Lord of all. But he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. What he's saying is that this child is treated as a... Hold on, let me get something here. All right, I'm going to give you two chapters here. I, I have the, the screen split. On the one part, I want to put Galatians 3. Galatians 3. And in the other part, I want to put Galatians 4 so we can make some comparisons. All right? So, at the end of Galatians 3, we saw where it says, You are Abraham's seed and you are heirs. Over in Galatians 4, it says, The heir, as long as he's a child, is no different from a servant, though he be lord of all. But he's under tutors and governors. It's the same thing he says, he says, he says a little earlier on in chapter 3. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. So he says, we were under tutors and governors. And he means, we were under the law, which was, which was our schoolmaster, or our tutor. The word schoolmaster is the same as the word tutors and governors. To bring us unto Christ. And here it says, until the time appointed of the Father. It's the same thing that Paul is saying what he's repeating himself he has just changed the illustration he's just going a little more deeply into the illustration he has he has changed the terminology but it's the same exact thing he's saying last part of chapter 3 first part of chapter 4 he says but he's making a different point in chapter 4 because he's going to use a different word here that he didn't use in chapter 3 he says the heir is no different from a servant while he's a child. He says, even so we, we Christians, Galatians, Gentiles, and Jews, when we were children, that is when, we, when God's people were in a state of childhood, he's not talking about you and me as, as, as little children running around and going, going about our business. He's talking about the Christian church, the people of God, while it was in a state of infancy. Not the Christian church, because it goes back into the Old Testament. When we were, were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. Now, what is he referring to as being in bondage here? He's talking about the heir differeth nothing from a servant. Now, he's talking about the heir, the child who is going to rule over everything. He says he's no different from a servant. So you can see that he's not using the word servant here to mean something bad because he's talking about the heir, the one who is to inherit the entire property. But he's treated like a servant. And he says, even so, or in the same way, if you understand my illustration, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. So is this bondage something bad or something good? Clearly, it's something good. It's, it's, it, it means being under the tutors and the governors. It means being treated as, a, it means being no different from a servant. This is what this bondage is referring to. What it means is to be under the complete control of somebody else. It means to have no control over your own behavior. This is exactly how it is with a child. All right? You don't, you, you, as, as we have been through this before, 
But somebody tells you when to put on your clothes, how to put on your clothes, what to eat, when to go out, when to come in, when to go to bed, when to wake up, where to go to school. You're under bondage. You're completely dominated by the ideas of somebody else. This is the bondage Paul is talking about. And he says, this is how it is with a child. Even though he's an heir, he's put under tutors and governors. And Paul says in chapter 3, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. We were put in bondage under the law. We were put under the complete dominion and control of an external force to tell us how to behave, to compel us how to behave, because we were still spiritual children. And this was to last until the seed should come. So Paul says we were in bondage under the elements of the world. So what were these elements of the world? The, these elements of the world here refer to the, the law. And I'll just show you that very quickly. I'll just, well, I'll remind us of it, really. In Hebrews chapter 9, in verse 1, when Paul refers to the, 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 the law, Paul says, Then verily or truly the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Worldly. It was of this world. When you go down to verse 9, look at what he says. Verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. In other words, what we see is that the law was of the elements of the world. It was not, the law contained nothing that was from heaven. A sanctuary made out of Goat skin, sheep skin, board, gold, silver, implements of this world, a lamb of this world, bread from this world, incense from this world, feasts focused on this world, waving palm branches, eating food of this world. Everything in it was of the elements of the world. And Paul says this is what happened to us when we were children. We were in bondage or we were subject to these things. Even the commandments had to do with life in this world. They had to do with behavior in this world. They did not have to do with the spiritual realities of, of our status as heavenly beings. But he goes on to say, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. He also was born under this system to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So, to be under the law means to be under the bondage of a worldly system. To be redeemed from this system, to be redeemed from this system, means to become the sons of God, which means you are no longer under this worldly system. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, you are no more under bondage. And what he's saying here, especially, you are no longer under the dominion of the law. But you are a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And this is Paul's use of the word bondage in this book of Galatians. But I want to go over to chapter 5 to see where he uses the word again. In fact, let me look at another place here in chapter 4. Chapter 4, where he uses it. He talks about these Galatians wanting to go back to the works of the law. He says, but now after the, you, that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements, the elements of the world, Whereunto you, you desire again to be in bondage. When he says you desire again to be in bondage, he's looking at them as a part of the body of God's people. Their history is the Old Testament, just like yours and mine is. As God's people, that's our history. And, and, and Paul is saying, you want to go back to that bondage where our forefathers, our spiritual forefathers were. The bondage to the elements of the world or to the law. And he talks about them going back to keeping feast days. You observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. What was it they really wanted to do? Observe days and months and times and years. They wanted to be circumcised. And see Paul says, 
Paul says he expresses their desire. Tell me, verse 21, you that desire to be under the law. That was what they wanted. They were not trying to be subject to, to pagan festivals. They wanted to be under the law. They wanted to be governed by the law. They wanted to be told what to do. They wanted to be instructed about how to behave moment by moment. Why? Because they did not have, they did not recognize the, the, the guidance of the Spirit of God. Don't you hear the law? And Paul goes on to show that they, the, the government of the law is a law of bondage. He talks about Abraham's two sons, one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. He's talking about Isaac and Ishmael. And he says, which things are an allegory. It's an illustration. For these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai which gendereth the bondage which represents Hagar. So he says clearly that bondage in his, in his terminology, bondage means the covenant from Mount Sinai. And we, we know that the heart of this covenant is the Ten Commandments. Alright? Just in case you don't know that, let me go and look at it quickly. In, Ox in Exodus 34, Paul comes down from the mountain. And he was there with the Lord in, in verse 28. Exodus 34 and verse 28. And he was there with the Lord. Forty days and forty nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant. The ten commandments. Alright. He wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant. The Ten Commandments. Paul says in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 24. For these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai which gendereth or gives birth to bondage. Which is Hagar. And this Hagar is Mount, is, is, is Mount Sinai in Arabia. And it answereth or it corresponds to Jerusalem which now is. And is in bondage with her children. So let nobody say that the Ten Commandments are not included in this covenant of bondage because it says clearly that the words of the covenant were the Ten Commandments. That's what Paul alludes to in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 where he says that um, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament? So we are ministers of the New Testament, not of the Old. And Paul expresses the Old by saying, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. The Spirit is the New. The letter is the Old. For the letter killeth, that's the Old, but the Spirit giveth life, that's the New. And to, to explain what he means by what kills, he says, but if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, this is the letter. This is what it says over here in, in Exodus he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And Paul, uh, Paul refers to it and calls it the ministry of death written and engraven in stones. And Paul says this gendereth to bondage, the covenant from Mount Sinai. So, I, 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 even though we are revising here, I'm fully aware that it, take, it needs a lot of time to go into this subject thoroughly. But the point, the point, the point is that the Ten Commandments are good. And God gave them for a good purpose. That purpose was to bring people to Christ. That purpose even, even today, they still serve a purpose in helping people to be aware of basic morality. But the Bible teaches that God's people are no longer under the law. Are no longer in the bondage of external government. We don't need something outside of us telling us how to behave. If you don't have Christ, you need this. I acknowledge this. If you don't have Christ, you need somebody to tell you how to behave. Because your natural behavior is unruly and ungodly. And so Paul says in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 9 that the law is not made for a righteous person. If you need the law, you fall into the category of the unrighteous. But for those people who have the Spirit of Christ in them, we do not need the law to tell us how to behave or to watch us, 
or to or to or to threaten us in order to make us behave aright. No. And this is why Paul says in the last verse I'm going to read. Paul says in Galatians Galatians 5 in verse 18. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. If you are led of the Spirit, you don't need the law. Your life is not governed by the law. Your life is not under the control of the elements of the world. You don't live by external things. This is something that the world finds strange and they condemn and criticize because they don't understand. Because the world has not seen this kind of Christianity. But by God's grace we are living in the age where all things are to be restored. And so the same Paul says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Sin shall not rule over you. Sin shall not control your life. For you are not under the law, but under grace. If you are led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. You are under grace, you are not under the law. The grace of God is the Spirit of God. You are not under the law, but you are under the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. This is what the Scripture says. And I know that people will continue to rail and to cavil and to scoff. But the word of God remains true forever. All right, I'm about to close off. Let me just acknowledge those of you who are here. Brother Ralph from Germany, always first. Glad to have you with us again, Brother Ralph. Sister Chris from Washington. God bless you, Brother Florian from Germany. God bless you, Brother Dian from Slovenia. Blessings, my brother. Brother Carlos Pereira from Portugal. Praise the Lord, you could be with us this evening. Brother Manus from South Africa, God bless you, brother. Good to see you again, Brother Robin from Texas. It was great, Robin. I mean, I, I'm still remembering. It was a joy being in your home and to meet your family. And I look forward to seeing you all again. Sister Jen from New Zealand, God bless you, my sister. Nice to have you with us, Sister Sharon from Miami. It was great to see you in Orlando. A surprise, a nice surprise. Sister Ruth and Sister Anne from Norway. God bless you. Brother Wayne from England. Hi to you and Nikki and the, the boys. A blessing to see you. Brother Michael from Germany. God bless you, my brother. Sister Jacqueline. Great to see you again too. It's nice to see you guys in Houston. Very nice. I enjoy the times we were able to meet together and to chat a bit. Um... I'm glad to know it was a blessing for you too. Brother Shenki, Brother Zulu from Zambia. Okay, all right, Zambia, all right, that's nice. I, I thought you were from South Africa. Brother Ovidio from Romania. Blessings, my brother. Sister Zeri, greetings. Brother Wes, thank you for the welcome, Brother Wes. Nice to have you here. I, I don't remember exactly where you're from, but great to have you. Sister Ellen. Matara, greetings as well. Brother Terence, glad you made it, man. I know you said it. You might have had a power outage. I'm glad you were able to be with us. Brother Laius, you ask a question here. Let me take a little extra time and answer. Some people claim to be sin-free. When do you see in time period when this is going to be 100% true? Is it after we receive the seal of God? To be honest, Brother Laius, I'm going to tell you, once I was certain what it meant to be sin-free, I was certain that we would never think a wrong act, never do a wrong action. As like, like one brother said, like one person said to me, don't even lick your fingers between meals. Once I thought this is what sinlessness meant. These days, I'm having to rethink. I, I wonder if the problem is not in how we view sinlessness. Yes, I know there's going to come a time when we're absolutely in unshadowed union with Christ. And I suppose this is real sinlessness when our, our, our focus is not distracted from him. If we view sinlessness in this way, then yes, I agree. I think it will be after the sealing. At the same time, I think that if we understand sin, the definition of sin properly, that sin is 
in its ultimate definition, separation from God, then I would say we are already, most of us, sin-free. He that is born of God does not commit sin, and he cannot commit sin. What did John mean by that? How, how is it that you cannot commit sin if sin simply means not licking your finger between meals, not, not thinking, not, not, not having your mind drift for a moment? How can anybody ever be sin-free in this unrealistic way? But I think, as the Bible says, that Christ has made an end of sin. When that union between us and Christ is complete, I believe this is a state of being free from sin. And probably this is what John was speaking about. At least it makes sense to me. Um, Brother Bacon from... Is in Brazil, I think. All right. Sister Bobby, greetings. I, I, I'm sorry you weren't able to make it to the meetings in Florida, but it was great seeing David and Mackenzie. God bless you, Brother David. It was great seeing you too. Ah, let me see. Thank you for the comments, guys. God bless you and have a good evening. I'll see you all next week. Take care.